Hello, I'm Daniel and this is Heather. And once again, we are doing Complaints on the Podcast. Today, we're going back to our favorite topic, which 50% of our podcasts so far have been on this topic. Yeah. It's uh, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. You can't get enough of it. Why is that, Heather? <laughs> well, it's probably because we're anti-Semitic, it's not. Um, uh, well, that could, that could be one reason, yeah, but let's... Uh, okay. <laughs> let's not jump to conclusions. All right, it could be something else. So I, th- I said in the last video that we should all care about the anti-Semitism witch hunt that's happening in the Labour Party because it's being used as a control on who has access to state power, even at the kind of lowly level, who can stand to be a Labour councillor in um, safe or unsafe Labour seats, actually. And so we've become aware of people who have become deselected or blocked from even becoming selected as Labour councillors because of accusations of anti-Semitism that are upheld against them. So we thought we'd begin by trying the unenviable task of explaining to some degree what the anti-Semitism narrative is, what it's kind of built on and why it's so damaging and why uh, a lot of people find it difficult to, to sort of fight against, right? And so we thought we'd begin by going back to that clip that we used in the last video with Aaron Bastani on, um, uh, what's it called? I can't remember the name. Oh, it's this week. Oh yeah, on this week. Uh, but instead of talking about Aaron Bastani's appearance, we're gonna look at the very beginning of that topic in which Andrew Neil introduces the anti-Semitism problem within Labour. And uh, he decided, he had, he has quite a sort of strange news article that he brings up to introduce this. Should we, should we play a bit of the clip? Yeah, let's, let's play that clip. An evil demon we thought had been slain. Anti-Semitism pollutes society on both sides of the channel once more. I was told today that polls and focus groups show many Brits, not just the young, don't know what anti-Semitism is. Well, gather round. Mirelle Knoll was 85, in a wheelchair suffering from Parkinson's. She'd survived the Holocaust, but not an attack last Friday in her Paris council flat, stabbed 11 times and burnt to death because she was Jewish. That, dear viewer, is anti-Semitism at its deadliest and most depraved, which is how it always ends up and which is why it can't be tolerated. Those still in doubt need to educate themselves fast. So this is a current affairs show in the UK that talks primarily about what's happening in Westminster politics. And at the beginning of this segment, he's talking about a violent murder in Paris, which has nothing to do with the politics of the UK, certainly nothing to do with the internal politics of the Labour Party. But the actual uh, topic of that of the of that they're going on to discuss in which Aaron Bastani talks and Robert Winston makes a short video about is exactly that it's about the internal labor membership and um people within that uh, within the PLP and within the membership talking about uh the fact that they believe there's anti-semitism there right and it just has nothing to do with a violent murder in Paris and to, so to link it is yeah to bring in this uh idea of uh the threat of, of real uh, racial violence occurring in the streets of the UK because of what, and linking that to uh, large amounts of people joining the Labour Party. It's amazing. I think it's like probably good to listen to the rest before we say it too much, but I do think dwelling on the details of the crime is really important. Like it, he tells us how many times she's been stabbed. It's very kind of, um, salacious I don't think that's important um, it's it's kind of really an exploitative form of representing someone's murder now only a few years ago it would have been well nigh impossible even to contemplate Britain's main left of center party mired in multiple accusations of anti-semitism yeah, that is precisely the predicament in which Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party now finds itself. For all of its history, Labour has been the natural home of Jewish workers, intellectuals and aspiring politicians in this country. Yet this week, Jewish groups demonstrated against Labour outside Parliament. It was unprecedented. 
Every day brings fresh accusations of anti-Semitism at worst, insensitivity to Jewish concerns at best, reaching to the very top of the Labour Party. Even Mr Corbyn himself was criticised for opposing the destruction of a clearly anti-Semitic wall mural in East London a few years back. Right. So, so coming out of that, I think what's really important is to link those two clips together, because they are one after the other in, in the way the show is constructed. And... Um, what he says, I think, Andrew Neil, is, is this is how it always ends. And it's an evil that's haunting our, our lives that we thought had gone. I don't know why anyone thought anti-Semitism had gone, first of all. That's kind of bizarre. I, I don't think any forms of racism and other, other forms of discrimination go. They, they change forms. And certainly Andrew Neil, given the amount of time he spends hanging out with the far right, should be very well aware that anti-Semitism has not disappeared. Um, but he conjures this idea that it had gone and it's coming back and the two manifestations of it coming back are a woman being brutally murdered in, in, in France and the Labour Party. That is an encapsulate of the, the anti-Semitism witch hunt. It's, it's the taking of something that is real, that we think we know what it is, and putting it into a context where it means something different and it's doing something different and pretending that these are the same thing, pretending that the anti-Semitism he speaks about in the first half of the clip is the same as the anti-Semitism he's speaking about in relation to the Labour Party. And I don't think they are the same thing. Yeah, so we'll talk about what exactly was the, the discussion uh, within the Labour Party around anti-Semitism later, but I think it is important that first we talk about all of the problematic ideas, all of the, the larger anti-Semitic ideas that were kind of bundled in, right? So we've talked about violently murdering people, right? This That's one. Uh, but it's it's the other sort of anti-Semitic tropes, which, uh, you know, just were not uh, in discussion, were not something that were on people's mind within the Labour Party, that were kind of thrown in, oh, this is happening and this is happening also. Um, and it's sort of building up this idea that there is all of these different anti-Semitic uh, tropes and discussions that are taking place in the party. So, for example, uh, after Jeremy Corbyn released the video uh, in response to Morgan Stanley, so Morgan Stanley uh, <laughs> made a statement, like a, like a public address, you know, to the nation, uh, saying, oh, um, Jeremy Corbyn, if you go for him, he's a threat to people like us, Morgan Stanley, you know, the beloved bank of, uh, that we all yes. love. And so you don't want to see poor old Morgan Stanley getting bad, do you? Um, but the, you know, the idea was we are, you know, a big established bank and, you know, okay, we've made a few mistakes in the past, but we keep your money safe and we keep things ticking over and Jeremy Corbyn's going to disrupt all this. And that's the sort of that Tory line, isn't it? You can't trust the left, you can't trust Labour with uh, finances, they don't know what they're doing, right? Uh, yeah. So Jeremy Corbyn made a video response to this saying that he was a threat. He was a threat to the, the banking class, to the, the organization itself, right? Which for, for a long time had uh, taken a lot of money, a lot of taxpayers' money to bail itself out and hadn't really given anything back. And then uh, Stephen Pollard, who at the time maybe still is the editor of the Jewish Chronicle. Now they've got another person who's almost as bad now. Almost as bad, Jewish okay. Stephen's <laughs> <Steve, Steve laughs> anyway. like editor at large or some weird honorary thing. So uh, Stephen Pollard, who was editor at the time, uh, wrote a tweet saying, um, he could, he also, in his own tweet says, you can't believe he's saying this, <laughs> which is funny. He said, I can't believe this is true, uh, but it must be true because I'm thinking it. And I think that what Jeremy Corbyn is really talking about is not the banks. He's really talking about us, meaning Jewish people. And he's made this whole video about Morgan Stanley and about reforming the banks, not because he wants to reform the banks, not because he has any problem with Morgan Stanley, but because he doesn't like Jewish people, basically. He's, he's, it's like he's attacking Morgan Stanley because he thinks that Morgan Stanley is a is a, is a bank and therefore it's representation of sort of Jewish corruption, something like that, right? Yeah. Um, so he he brings the anti-Semitic trope to the party, right? And then blames Jeremy Corbyn for being an anti-Semite. Now this particular tweet was at the time seen as a step too far because this was 2018, I think it was, it was you know, the anti-Semitism uh, narrative, it's, it's something that grew 
into being something that's, that now is unquestionable. But there was a period where people were sort of questioning it, where people would say, OK, there's a problem, but Jeremy Corbyn certainly isn't the problem. And then slowly it was like, OK, there's a problem, and Jeremy Corbyn is part of that problem. It's grown hugely, hasn't it? We got pretty bigger, like, actually the whole of the left is a problem, and until yeah, we the get whole the of the left out, the Labour Party. Yeah. So, yeah, but I was, I was just going to say, um, at the time, he got a lot of... Uh, a lot of sort of kickback against this tweet and then did apologize for it and he actually said which is really interesting and revealing he said oh i'm sorry for uh writing this tweet of you know sort of saying misunderstanding this morgan stanley video but and in his defense he said but if um if if you have a lot of anti-semitism uh within the labor party there's a lot of anti-semitism around then it becomes very difficult to know what is anti-semitic and what isn't and I think that's very revealing, right? Because that he's basically, in a way, admitting that yeah, if you if you're fostering this narrative, then you can kind of make everything seem anti-Semitic. It's very difficult for people to argue one way or the other. Yeah, so that is what has happened: is that um, the overreach of this anti-Semitism narrative has got greater and greater. I mean, it's always been an overreach, but it's like it's it's taking it's it's removing our right to almost say anything. I I, I started to make a list. Um, the other day of what we can't say within the Palestinian solidarity movement because it's a trope, allegedly. Um, so one of that is about money, so about banking. So you can't talk about um, the role of money um, plays in, in um, support of Israeli apartheid, even though, of course, it's instrumental. Um, you can't talk about lobbying within that because, of course, that's a trope as well. You can't talk about media bias because media bias implies... Um, or it's said to imply or draw on a trope about Jews having power over the media, disproportionate power in the media, and all those kind of associated conspiracy theories. So all of those are, are tropes. Then you get on to, you can't make parallels with Nazism. And I understand one of the reasons for that. I, I make, it makes sense because obviously the, the Holocaust is a you know, deeply felt issue for everyone who's Jewish, including, including me. But to cut off parallels with all other events seems to me a problem to, to, to say they're de facto anti-Semitic rather, uh, rather than, for example, someone who sees some, a video coming out of Israel-Palestine and says, oh, it's extraordinary that I see Jewish people acting like this. Um, it reminds me, of, you know, particularly given the history and given their experiences under Nazism. I don't think that would make someone anti-Semitic. I don't think we should be seeking to make that person anti-Semitic because of that. Um, and similarly, boycott, divestment and sanctions is said to be a hate movement, said to be anti-Semitic, simply because it seemed to be targeting Israel disproportionately. And if you target Israel in any way differently to how you target any other countries, um, even if you're asking for boycott of other countries, if you're not asking for boycott of every single country that has any human rights abuse, you're singling out Israel, and therefore that's a denial of Israel's right to exist to some extent, or it's a double standard in, in treatment um, and so on. So again, that's anti-Semitic. And, and finally, I've noticed people labeling um, either any kind of images which focus on blood or any kind of narratives that focus on blood in relation to um, what's happening to Palestinians, or any narratives or images that focus particularly on children and children's deaths have been linked to blood libel, which is a, you know, a horrendous um, story that has a long history uh, uh, within, the, within the Christian West of saying that Jewish people steal Christian children, kill them, um, drain their blood and use their blood, for example, for making like mozzas, which is um, the kind of, flat um, unleavened bread that people have at Passover. So it's particularly a story which, um, a Semitic story that used to kind of circulate around this time of year, around near Easter and Passover. So it seems to be extraordinary that all of these things, of course, boycott, sanctions, children, um, blood, um, the role of money, the role of the media, are all things that we talk about routinely in talking about oppression. We can see that in the way we'd have to talk, we've been talking about Ukraine and the situation, the oppression they're suffering under Russian invasion. And so we're taking away the kind of very language that people have to describe what's 
Palestinians have to describe what's happening to them and that the Palestinian solidarity movement has to talk about honestly about what is happening in Israel-Palestine. Um, and, and I think you can see the parallels to what you were speaking about, about anti-capitalism suddenly becoming something you can't speak about. The very language of anti-capitalism has now become an anti-Semitic trope. So you're taking away from people who um, are, you know, all of us who are suffering under capitalism, the language we need to describe what's happening. Um, and it's almost like we're, the whole language of left is being erased through this. Yeah, so the idea is that you have uh, anti-Semitic tropes um, which are well-founded and, and historically have been used um, to attack uh, Jewish people. Um, and what you do is you then sort of spread those over into conversations that are not about anti-Semitism at all. Uh, and you sort of push that into uh, the conversation. And the reason you can do that is because you've slowly been establishing a uh, anti-Semitic narrative around the Labour Party. I think it's one of the problems with the use of the word weaponizing, because if you say um, people are weaponizing anti-Semitism against the left or weaponizing anti-Semitism against Palestine Solidarity Movement or against Jeremy Corbyn, you imply that there's some kernel of something which is then being blown up. It's more like they're anti-Semitinizing, like, like that's the verb, they're, they're, they're anti-Semitinizing some other argument, right? You're taking yes. an argument that's about capitalism or about Israel, and you're bringing anti-Semitism into it rather than weaponizing. It's not that people are um, anti-Semitic and then you are uh, weaponizing that somehow. It's that they're having another conversation and yes. you are sort of, sort of flavoring it with anti-Semitism or trying to make it seem as if it's an anti-Semitic conversation. Yeah, and I think actually it's a good time to start talking about why this worked um, rather than other forms of weapons that were attempted to be used against the left. And there are other ones which have had some effect, but I think the anti-Semitism witch hunt has been the most effective. So let's play clip number two, yeah? Yeah, so this is a left-wing MP going on BBC Radio to discuss another left-wing MP, Chris Williamson, who has just been suspended, not for anti-Semitism exactly, but as part of the anti-Semitism narrative. And, but the discussion is basically about whether Chris Williamson is anti-Semitic. Do you believe yes. he has behaved anti-Semitically? Um, I wouldn't make that judgment. I would say that he has uh, behaved foolishly in some of the stuff that he said and uh, whether that's anti-semitic or not that is for people who are either jewish or no, the it's panel not. who is set up i to can call out right i can call out i can call out racism and i'm not black you spend i'm sure many of your days doing that on behalf of people why on earth do you have to be jewish in order to identify anti-semitism well, the, the on an intellectual level, the, that falls foul on the, every the, level. The, the principles of McPherson was that people who are receiving the discrimination should be able to call it out. Of course they should, um, but they can others, be supported. I'm sure you're familiar. I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of being an ally to people. Yes. Right. So he has retweeted or approved. There are many examples anti-Semitic remarks on social media. I'm giving okay. you some but, of the examples. But, Hang on, no, no, because but, listeners but, may not be familiar. This is Chris Williamson. Okay. He spoke at an event called The Lynching, where another one of the attendees was suspended for a string of derisory comments about Jewish people. Even the event's title implied that being criticised for saying anti-Semitic things was like being strung up from a tree by racists. After a recording came out in which the former NEC member Peter Wilsman referred to Jewish Trump fanatics, Williamson tweeted his unconditional support for Wilsman. He's now been suspended from the Labour Party. In 2017, Williamson said that many people in the Jewish community are appalled by what they see as the weaponization of anti-Semitism for political ends. And the reason he was suspended this time is that he was suggesting that the party had given too much ground or been too apologetic and done the Labour Party had done more to address the scourge of anti-Semitism than any other party. Now, you will recognise that if you haven't campaigned with regards to anti-Semitism in other areas of work. I know you care greatly about LGBTQ issues. You will recognise that as gaslighting. So I ask you again, is Chris Williamson anti-Semitic? Has he behaved in an anti-Semitic okay. fashion? 
I think some of those tweets that you've read out there and some of the things that he said uh, do look like anti-Semitism to me. Um, and I would probably say on the balance of it, I would be uh, saying that they uh, look like they're anti-Semitic. Whether that is a threshold um, uh, that means that he is an anti-Semite in himself, that he can't go through retraining or through a, a process what of reconciliation what is the with the Jewish with the Jewish community. That is for the panel to determine. But Sorry, I would agree so with you've you. Just, you've just I would said agree that with he you has behaved that they probably anti are anti-Semitic, yes. So why was that so hard for you to say from the beginning? Well, you, you reminded me of, the, the, of some of the details of, of, of what he said. Yeah. Surely as a Labour MP you've engaged with that. This is a key problem in your party at the moment. Well, I have, have engaged with it on and off. I've been engaging with uh, lots of other issues locally. We've been struggling to sort out some local anti-Semitism and things where I've pushed for people to be suspended and chucked out of the local party. So, uh, Well, the point, OK, so it's, it's, it's a big problem. This is what's going on at the moment. The Labour Party's trying to grapple with it. But the, the question then is, should he be allowed to be a Labour MP? In light of what you've just reheard, and I take it that, you, you know, I accept you may not be fully across it, but thank you for listening. Should he be a Labour MP? Well, he shouldn't be a Labour MP unless there is some sort of um, uh, um, goes through um, recognising uh, what he said and uh, I think that's what the panel needs to determine. Is uh, any process possible, etc, etc. The thing which strikes me most about this video, and I think it's remarkable, is that in four minutes, and it is only four minutes, um, a an MP, so he's not like a political innocent, he's someone who has tackled difficult media interviews before, who's thought about issues, who's been in Parliament for, at like, this point, a few years, right? A couple of years, so that's in 2017, um, but presumably been political for a lot longer. In four minutes, he goes from a position of, yeah, you know, the guy's been a bit foolish, but he's not anti-Semitic, to, yeah, he's anti-Semitic, and he should, probably shouldn't be a Labour MP. Um, so let's look through uh, the actual uh, examples of anti-Semitism that are given um, against Chris Williamson. Uh, so the first one is that he went to see a, a play uh, written by Jackie Walker, who's not mentioned, it's not mentioned that the, the, the person that wrote this play is a, a Jewish woman, uh, Jackie Walker, who herself was uh, kicked out of the Labour Party for anti-Semitism. Uh, and she's also black, right? So. Um, but neither of these two things are mentioned, but what is kind of uh, expressed in the way that it's described is that the play is about anti-Semitism and uses the language of lynching, right? So it's sort of saying, well, you know, it's about anti-Semitism uh, and it's using this sort of horrible language about sort of racism that, that we associate with, uh, with the Ku Klux Klan um, lynching, lynching mobs in America. Right? What a disgusting thing to do. But of course, the person that wrote it is Jewish and black. So it makes a lot of sense for someone who's persecuted who's Jewish and black to talk about anti Semitism and lynching. But she doesn't mention that, uh, interestingly enough. So this is a play uh, that he went to see. So he's racist, he's anti Semitic because he went to see a play. The second thing that. And because is something happened at that play, but we don't even know what that is. She says, oh, and someone else was kicked out for some of the things that they said at that play. All right, so someone else. So there's just a kind of like this happens. Yeah. So, so he was there a play, and someone else was there, and they were kicked out, and he was near them, and that's pretty yes. bad. It's like yeah. he's, he's, that's really he's, bad. And this is the kind of thing is that he would. It's like they're they're around you're they're around the wrong people. They're doing you know. It's like there's a there's a sort of seedy underbelly of anti-Semitism, and you can't actually say. Chris Williamson has been anti-Semitic. It doesn't quote him at all saying anything anti-Semitic, but he was around people at times who, yeah. and, and they're not even quoted, but it's like, it's like building this atmosphere, right? Of uh, Without any real quotes of, of, anti of people being anti-Semitic or doing anything anti-Semitic. Uh, so the second thing that is said is, actually, I've forgotten now. So the second thing that, that she mentions is that, um, Chris Williamson tweeted unconditional support for Pete's Will Pete Willsman, even though he had talked about um, Trump supporting Jews, and that later after this, he was um, suspended from the Labour Party for that. Um, 
I mean, Pete Wilsman is not exactly the most subtle man in the world, and that's not the most subtle thing to say in the world. But you can talk about Trump supporting Jews, right? They well, exist. Yeah, uh, there's one. In, there's one on Hackney Council. Well, is that anti Semitic that, that you just said that? Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, point, it's pointing that out. I, you know, I mean, it's 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 really odd. Um, so again, it's it's like, what's Chris Williamson actually done here? I mean, he he's this is a sort of big, and he became a sort of poster child for you know this huge problem of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Look at uh, MP Chris Williamson suspended for anti-Semitism, and it's uh, what's the actual anti-Semitism that he's pushing? It's there's not really anything here so far. Um, and then what was the last thing she said? Um, she says that he said that anti-Semitism is being weaponized. I remember that one. Right. Um, yeah. So, so that's well, the, that. Yeah, that's the ultimate one. So then, it, so then it comes full, like sort of full circle. So it's like there's loads of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, uh, and then they list basically none. Uh, and then you say. Well, sounds like anti-Semitism's being exaggerated. Aha, that's the anti-Semitism right there. You're saying it's being exaggerated. And yeah. that certainly is the entire problem, is that people are saying it's being exaggerated. Uh, and that's what he was actually suspended for, uh, which he was secretly filmed in a momentum meeting, right, by somebody that wanted to catch him saying something like that. But he said, hey, you know, like, you noticed that actually there isn't much anti-Semitism. Like, for example, I went to a play and that was called anti-Semitic and doesn't see like there's a lot of concern about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, but there isn't actually that much of it. Uh, and if you say that, that becomes the anti-Semitism narrative. It's that people are denying there's anti-Semitism. Yeah. And of course, there was a lot of people saying there wasn't much anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. That was very widespread. The people saying that actually I don't think there is much of it. But then that becomes the actual anti-Semitism is that look, all these people are denying there's anti-Semitism. That is the anti-Semitism narrative. So it's you can't really you can't fight yeah. it because fighting it becomes the problem itself. It's, uh, so, it's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible, yeah. So yeah. there's a few things about that. So the, the that part of the anti-Semitism accusation um, is why Jeremy Corbyn has been uh, had the whip withdrawn. Right. It's yeah. why it's why I'm being investigated. All the accusations against me are because I said anti-Semitism has been weaponized. But then the majority of all of the sort of cases of anti-Semitism, certainly the suspensions um, yeah. and action, people being actioned for anti-Semitism, you know, quote unquote, is just people saying that they don't believe that the anti-Semitism is as widespread as is being sort of pushed, as, yeah. as the narrative is suggests. It is really maddening, absolutely. But a really important thing to grapple with is that that idea that um, it's a problem to underplay the role of anti-Semitism, the significance of anti-Semitism, a prominence of it in the Labour Party. If you, the origin story of that is within the left leadership of the Labour Party, and I talk about that in one of my videos, so I'll put a link to it. But I think we don't have to really track it back. It's all in the, the leaked report, that, that. But we can see it here. We can see that significant sections of the left, Lloyd Russell Well is not one of the right-wing MPs. He's not Margaret Hodge. He's not, um, I don't know, who else? Chuck Romana, who bravely quit the Labour Party because of the anti-Semitism um, accusations. And it's, it, he wanted to be an a, a anti-racist crusader. So he set up a new party. Um, so he, he's not one of those. He is someone who supports Jeremy Corbyn, who supports the left of the party, who was part of the Socialist Campaign Group. And I think that's really important is for us to look at how effective this is against the left, even when people know that ha what's happening with it in, in reality, they can't, they can't, um, they, they, yeah, they topple, they cave really rapidly. Yeah, well, it's such a it's such a horrible um, accusation to have thrown at you to be to be called an anti semite and um, particularly, you know, if you're in a if you're in a, a public role, if you're if you're an MP or or a journalist, um, that's that's a that's a horrible thing to to have said. Um, and even myself, I was just a sort of um, rank and file member, but it didn't, you know. I obviously I'm in no position to say 
really, if it was anti-Semitism the Labour Party or not. But all I could say was that it, it seemed uh, uh, exaggerated to me. That's, but, but I knew that if I said that, that I would um, face a lot of hostile... Um, I, I did. I, I got into some arguments with people about it, um, and it was it was unpleasant. It was unpleasant. I didn't want to spend my time arguing with other Labour members about this issue, right? That's not why I joined the Labour Party. Um, so yeah, you tended to not speak up about it. You tended to ignore it, and um, and and people like Chris Williamson tended to be sort of thrown under the bus um, for because because the other thing is it's not just that. You know the uh, MPs capitulated to this, but um, Chris Williamson was suspended for saying it was exaggerated, which is exactly what Corbyn actually came out with in the end. So there was problem at the very top of the leadership with how to deal with this. Yeah. Um, and I and there was also obviously uh, uh, a lack. So the, so there was a lack of support from the leadership in some regard. There was certainly a, a lack of leadership of how, how we should deal with this problem. But that, that was also in the media as well. Uh, obviously, it's on the one hand, it's, you can blame the Labour leadership and the media for this problem. But the actual real problem is the people that are causing this atmosphere, that are making the accusations. Um, they're the actual problem. But we, can, we can't really expect... Uh, or, or we have to um, expect some sort of smear campaign like this to happen, yeah. you know, always. So, you know, we, we can't say, well, I ho you know, hopefully those people have learned their lesson because I don't think they have. There will always be a smear campaign. Well, they've learned a lesson, but it's not. Yeah, they've learned the words. Learn. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. So, and they're still so, using it. You know, yeah. Uh, for us, we, we want to talk about... Uh, you know, how the Labour leadership, if, 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 if say it was in that situation again, what it could do differently and, and what the left media could have done differently, I think, uh, I think, given the situation. Yeah, I think I also want to talk about just how as individual members we can do things differently now, because that's, I think, where I'm coming from. Um, so I, I was reading an interview um, with Loki, who's um, a, a Palestinian solidarity activist and also... Um, a musician and he's had he's been attacked and there's been calls to take his music off um spotify um in response you know because of claims that he's anti-semitic and he says two things which i think are really relevant one is that it isn't just that it's unpleasant to be called anti-semitic um which it, it really is obviously but that there's a kind of there are sometimes material consequences for people people have lost their livelihoods been disqualified from political subjectivity and and so i think it's a is a little bit easier for me to speak out because i'm self-employed i think if i had an employer that it would be harder um and the, the other thing he says is that they want um, to stop people standing in solidarity with others they want to kind of set people beyond um the the sense of solidarity so they want people to be embarrassed to stand with you they want to use standing with you as a reason to blacklist others. Uh, and so I think we need to, as individuals, to fight on both of those. As far as we're able, we need to publicize and speak about this. And we certainly need to um, stand in solidarity with others as much as we can. So for me, one of the things which really interests me about this clip is I think it's a metaphor of what's happened. For the way in which, when you are facing an accusation of anti-Semitism, locally in the party, either against you or against um, someone else. Um, people, people can't hold on to resisting that. People can't hold on to solidarity with those people in the same way that, that Lloyd can't in this clip. And I think even if you know that you're not guilty when you're accused, it's really hard to approach an accusation of anti-Semitism without any self-doubt. So when someone says to you, oh, by the way, you use tropes from the protocols of the elders of Zion, or you use tropes from blood libel. I, a lot of people don't even know what these things are, but if you do know what these things are, it's, it's really shocking because these are really, really disturbing, disgusting, um, racist conspiracy theories that have, I, th I think it works if you don't know what they are as well, because they right. start to mean people have heard these phrases and they the, the sort of connotate blood libel. You know, it sounds really kind of deep occult Nazi kind yeah. of stuff, right? And it is. I mean, it genuinely is that, but it, 
it, so that carries with it. I think people feel fear and people feel shame. I think it's very hard not to feel those two things. Um, I think the shame is, is for the reasons we've said. Um, and the fear comes out of the, the very kind of quasi-judicial process in which this is all wrapped up. So it feels like you get called in before panels, for example, you get like a list of charges against you that you have to defend yourself against. Um, all of this stuff is part of what they're doing. And it feels like you're being put on trial. I mean, the worst thing that can happen to you is you get chucked out of the Labour Party. In most cases, it's true that there is reputational damage for some people that affects more things. But in most cases, that's the worst sanction. You're not going to get put in prison. But it feels sometimes like they can do worse things to you because of the legalistic framework. Um, and I think it then becomes very difficult to speak about it in public, very difficult to navigate it, very difficult not to make kind of concessions that, that Lloyd makes. And I think once you've made those kind of concessions to a narrative, it becomes very hard to come back from that. So I just want to read something that Liz Davis said to me. So Liz Davis is um, uh, an amazing woman because she was faced with a lot of attacks um, under Blair's leadership against her, and she stood firm against those, um, and she got legal redress in the end. And I was talking to her about how come some people struggle so much to do what she did. And she says, once someone's compromised, they never really come back. They have to convince themselves of why they are right to compromise. And the intellectual exercise of that means that it's impossible to return. I think part of the purpose of this is to put people, is to, to begin to crush people, to be, begin to take the fight out of people. At this point, and I feel this is probably true, I don't know, there are a lot of journalists on the left who uh, at some point decided that there was a problem or at least capitulated to the fact that there was an anti-Semitic narrative in the Labour that was a serious problem and it was legit legitimate. Uh, at this point, I think they, they won't go against it, as you say, because there's pressure not to. But also, it's a sort of saving face exercise, right? In the fact that they've put a lot of their sort of political weight, their, their journalistic weight, I suppose, behind the fact that the, this was an issue. And you feel a lot of the time you watch Navarra now or, or Owens Jones and his podcast, they're sort of discussing these things with one hand tied behind their back because they won't actually confront this major narrative. So the last clip we're going to look at is when Alexi Sale, the left-wing Corbyn-supporting Jewish comedian, went on Owen Jones's YouTube channel. You know, there was a there was a, a an extraordinary assault on you know a decent you know painting this decent, ridiculously honourable man as a as a racist and as you know a, a Russian spy and various other smears that they tried. So before we watch this clip, I just want to say this is not. Uh, an attack against Owen Jones. I mean, it is an attack against Owen Jones, but it's to show a, a larger problem with the left media's uh, critique of what's going on. I think Owen Jones um, has done some great journalism. I've, I've learned a lot from him. I've, I've watched his podcast often and I've seen him on Navarra and he often has uh, great analysis. Yeah, so I think we should say we're using the Owen Jones clip in the same way we use the Lloyd Russell Mile clip. Not to say, Lloyd, you're, you know, you're a problem, but to say this clip encapsulates a general problem for the left. I mean, on that, I mean, uh, because obviously, look, I'm not Jewish. I'm a, I'm a guy. And uh, I mean, on anti-Semitism, so my position was always that Jeremy Corbyn is clearly not anti-Semitic. And the vast majority of the Labour membership aren't anti-Semitic either and a poor anti-Semitism. But that there was a minority who either were anti-Semitic, and I know that because I've got a Facebook page and I had to remove people who said gratuitously anti-Semitic things, and others who were just very tone deaf about how they would speak about it. And that caused upset amongst Jewish people, including Jewish people I know who voted for Jamie Corbyn. So it wasn't like they were kind of people who were not this predisposed to him. They voted for him. And right, voted yeah. So I just wondered about that because obviously... Okay, so I think this, this is interesting. Uh, this is broadly, I think, what most uh, sort of people even on the left sort of put their position as. 
Uh, it wasn't a big problem, but there was a problem, right? Uh, the, the issue I take with that is that that's not the anti-Semitism narrative, right? The anti-Semitism narrative is there was a big problem, okay? And this is what the, this is the discussion they should be having. So um, Owen Jones saying that I don't think Jeremy Corbyn was anti-Semitic and I don't think it was a big problem. That's him actually going against the anti-Semitism narrative. And therefore he should be challenging what MPs and journalists were saying. But in a way, it's, it's, it's sort of fudged as a sort of compromise position when in actual fact, that's, that's exactly what we're saying. It's just we're calling out people that push that narrative, whereas he is sort of pretending that he accepts that there was a problem and therefore that, that because he accepts that there was some anti-Semitism, he therefore is, accepts that the, it was legitimate that there was this big narrative uh, around anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, right? So I think there's two differences between what he's saying and what we're saying. So the first one is he's, he, um, he advocates walking and chewing gum, which is that you call out left anti-Semitism even while you, you attack the organisation of anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, he's given up on walking. He's simply chewing gum at this stage. Yeah. He is just... And it must be very tough on his jaws to have been chewing gum for this long. Um, and it means that he's not going anywhere. So that's the first thing which is different. The second thing which is different is that he sees it as a weaponization of something, of real anti-Semitism. And I think like what we're saying is that these are two distinct things. There is real anti-Semitism um, in, in the world that we live in. And then there is what is being said about anti-Semitism the Labour Party, which is, and these two things cannot be connected. And his whole narrative is to connect them and to relentlessly connect them to such an extent that you don't even talk about what is being done. You don't even talk about the witch hunt. And you get right. to such a point where you, where you do not, you talk about how you have to acknowledge the lived experience of Jewish people who you know. In front of a Jewish person who you know, whose lived experience <laughs> yeah. you negate. That is yeah. where this situation gets you. It's it's a, basically his whole point is uh, not is to ignore that there is this narrative, right? To ignore that there is this huge kind of uh, media and uh, labor MP uh, push everything we've been talking about in this video that there's this huge problem of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. He doesn't want to even mention that that's that's a factor, right? But that's the real issue that we're dealing with. That's why. Uh, Labour was so damaged in, in electorally for people that were, were concerned with that issue. And that's why Jeremy Corbyn was suspended. And that's why all of this is happening is because of this huge narrative that the Labour Party under Corbyn became this basically a party of anti-Semitism. And he won't even address that issue. He doesn't even think that that's what, what the topic is, that he's pretending that's not what Alexis Sale's asking him about. He's like saying, yeah. oh, well, there was a little bit of anti-Semitism in the party, so, you know, you can't deny that, can you? It's like, well, we're not even talking about that. So there is a kind of internal logic, a, a correct logic to what Owen Jones is saying, that he's not putting very well, but I have heard put by Jews on left. And the logic of that argument is, well, if we just dealt with anti-Semitism, there would be nothing to weaponize. And that is a very seductive argument, and it sounds very convincing, right? But it only sounds convincing if you think that what is happening, um, this narrative has some connection to anti-Semitism and that we can use what is going on in the Labour Party around anti-Semitism to actually address anti-Semitism. And that's a fatal flaw in the argument. And I just think that the Jewish Voice for Labour position has been much clearer on this. And it's much more what Alexei Sale is saying, but that's not a position that, that Owen Jones can take on. And it's also a position that he's actively repudiated. He will not stand in solidarity with some of those people under attack because it's not possible within the narrative that, that he's understanding it in. So, you know, what does he make of Jeremy Corbyn's suspension in that regard? Because he says Jeremy Corbyn's not anti-Semitic. Jeremy Corbyn has been sus suspended, not for anti-Semitism, but, but basically the way that the narrative plays out, people assume that it's because he is anti-Semitic, right? And he is suspended in, as, as Owen Jones fully, well knows he's suspended in the same way that the vast majority of people have been suspended for calling out the narrative, not for explicit anti-Semitism. And so he knows that and he sees that happening to Jeremy Corbyn and he says still publicly that Jeremy Corbyn is not anti-Semitic. But then he won't uh, say that this may have happened to other people, that the 
uh, not just Jeremy Corbyn, but, but even one other person might have been suspended or have been actioned, uh, not because they're anti-Semitic, but because of this narrative that is purging left-wing Jews. As uh, Alexis Sale goes on to say, a lot of people that are being expelled and suspended are Jewish. Obviously, look, I always find this difficult to talk about, not least. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, but, yeah. But, I, you know, that there was... I mean, I guess the way that Jewish people I'm close to explain it to me is that if you're part of a minority that suffered 2,000 years of persecution and at times things seem fine, you're accepted, and then just like that, the winds chain, you have to move. And that's the history of being Jewish throughout history. There's this sensitivity. But I'm now goisplaining a Jewish person, so that's not great. <laughs> but that's, that's the position put to me and what I know people who... Take John Landsman. John Landsman founded Momentum. He was instrumental in the rise of Corbynism, both leadership elections. He helped run Tony Benn's deputy leadership campaign in 1981. And he would say there's a problem with anti-Semitism amongst the minority that has to be dealt with. And he's, I've seen the stuff he gets, and i kind of like, oh my, grim. And I'm like, really? yeah, I mean that, so I just kind of think, I always called it walk and chew gum that it's possible to believe that Jeremy Corbyn is definitely not anti-Semitic and the vast majority of Labour members aren't anti-Semitic. But don't you think that what, you know, Jeremy said that the, 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 you know, the scale of it was vastly exaggerated for political purposes? Don't you think that's the case? I mean, I suppose the problem I'd have with that is that... I do want to... I just think the... Let's, let's stop it there because I think that that next question will come back with that. Alexi Sale asking him outright, do you think it's being exaggerated? But just before that. So there are two different conversations that are taking place. Right? One, of, one of the conversations is that if you are in the Labour Party and you experience some anti-Semitism, you would like people around you to give you solidarity, right? You don't want people to say, to dismiss your uh, anti-Semitism as being, you being harassed by other members, right? And who can disagree with that? I don't think that's, ever been disagreed with because it's never really actually been put as an argument. But that's really all that Owen Jones is saying. And what Alexi Sell is talking about is this huge, you know, the media articles, the suspension of MPs who are talking out about it, um, people like Margaret Hodge calling Jeremy Corbyn and anti -Semite. He's talking about this whole other thing that was happening, right? And this whole linking of the Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn's uh, political um, uh, projects, I suppose, uh, uh, attempts to um, to bring people together, uh, his meet various meetings he's had about Palestine, uh, all of this kind of stuff, and bringing this in to meaning that Labour was now a sort of anti-Semitic movement, and they're just not the same conversation. Yes, so yeah, they're two. They're talking about two different things, but they're having they are having a conversation, and that's part of the problem, because in that conversation, because Owen Jones responds in the way he does to that stuff, to the hasn't it been weaponized persistent yeah. questions from Alexi Sale, because he responds with, well, you know, I've seen anti-Semitism. John Lansman's seen anti-Semitism. Other Jewish people I know have seen anti-Semitism. And not just that, but um, we have to be better. On the left, we have to be better. We're the vanguard. Because he responds with that, then suddenly the conversation with Alexi Sale has been trying to have becomes the, isn't there a problem in the Labour Party? Isn't what you're saying part of that problem? And it, it that's so yeah. it, it matters that, that they're having it as a dialogue, even though they're not really talking to each other, even though they are as cross purposes, because the frameworks they're using are yeah. completely Owen different. Jones, yeah. Owen Jones, whether he realises it or not, is, 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 is linking these two things, where if you discuss the media narrative, you are somehow um, going against uh, uh, Jewish people's lived experience. You are somehow, uh, um, what's the phrase, dismissing dismissing um, some Jewish people's voices. But of course, what's happening is you are disagreeing with some people in the party. Some are Jewish, some are not. And you are agreeing with other people, some are Jewish, who are not. You're not, it's, you're not really dismissing a particular Jewish person's uh, experience of the Labour Party. The, the, you're, you're, you're talking about a very big narrative that a lot of people are a part of. But don't you think that what you know, Jeremy said, that the, 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 you know, the scale of it was vastly exaggerated for political purposes? Don't you think that's the case? I mean, I suppose the problem I'd have with that is that I just think the kind of the best way of approaching it would be to say that wherever there's anti-Semitism, it's a problem and we should do more to get rid of it. I don't know. I mean, 
and that because I know lots of Jewish people who would say if you look at the statistics of reports about anti-Semitism, which the statistics, it's obviously a very small number, but there are lots, lots of examples of any for in, in society, most racism generally isn't reported. Um, and that the kind of more emotionally intelligent way to go about it is to go, wherever it is, it's a problem and we need to do more to get rid of it. Um, but don't you think it's like bizarre that a lot of, you know, people who are being, you know, expelled from the Labour Party for anti-Semitism are Jewish? Don't you think that's just strange? You know, there are a lot of the, the, the you know, the, the people I know who are like, you know, actually like somebody like Moshi Makhova, for instance, who has been, you know, suspended is not, you know, is, a, is an Israeli Jew. And don't you think that's odd that uh, somebody like that can be suspended for anti-Semitism? Yeah, I mean... Do you yeah, think it was weaponized? It is being weaponized to as an attack on on um, on left wing voices as a generalized attack because most most uh, people who are left wing will be pro Palestinian and therefore yeah look I, look I'll be honest I've you know because of my support for Jeremy Corbyn and for the Palestinian struggle for national self determination of course I've had that against me but I, I mean i just always when i speak to jewish people including jewish people on the left and i can see that their anger and upset is real that it's not contrived it's real then in the same way that if a black person was talking about their lived experience or a muslim was talking about their lived experience then i just think you know i have a responsibility to listen and obviously there are except that in any minority there's always a range of views, but I just, it seemed that all the evidence pointed to the, a very large majority of Jews, including those who'd voted Labour before, seemed, you but know, some genuine distress. Yeah, I, well, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, clearly there are, you know, anti-Semitism is a real thing. There are multiple studies that show that people on the left are much less inclined towards hatred of Jews than, uh, than people on the right or people of, of no political persuasion at all. And that it was used as a, you know, it was used and is being used as a tactic. You don't kind of accept that? I think that you'd hope, you'd expect the left to be, because sometimes what I heard, and this is what I found a bit difficult, I think, was when people said um, that anti-Semitism exists in society and therefore it exists in the Labour Party. And of course, that's that's true. But if we're the left, we're like the vanguard against... We're not there to replicate the bigotries in society. We're there to destroy them. So if there's any bigotry in our ranks, that's a problem. And I just felt... So one thing I would think, I do think there is this issue, which is leftism, as I understand it, socialism understands capitalism as a series of competing power relations and social forces. It's kind of broadly Marxist perspective, I suppose. and. There's another element which is kind of conspiratorial, which doesn't see injustice as about competing social forces, but as about shadowy individuals pulling strings behind the scenes. And that conspiratorial mindset always leads to anti-Semitism and has done. I mean, anti-Semitism is basically the deadliest conspiracy theories ever devised. So people will talk about the Rothschilds who I think the 1,100th richest family on earth, rather than the financial sector and finance capital. And I do think a small minority, and I do need to emphasize that, it's a small minority, are, end up attracted to the left when actually their mentality isn't of being of the left, which is a fighting injustice, but about fighting conspiracies. And there's a kind of weird tangent that's emerged and I'd say that's a small minority. I just think yeah. the reason that many Jews, including left-wing Jews, felt aggrieved was they felt they came across that in their lived experience against them. And then there were people saying, it's all a smear, it's all a smear. And they felt like they were being gaslit because they were like, well, I've experienced this personally, rather than them saying, I'm really sorry that you felt You've, you've felt this and we need to do more to make you feel safe. I've said a lot. And again, I'm not Jewish and this is. So I think 
So I think a difficult thing to talk about. I think you're right that, yes, it puts you agreeing with some people who are Jewish, some people who are not, or disagreeing with some people who are Jewish, some people who are not. But it's important important and difficult to talk about the fact that the majority of Jewish people in this country are on one side of this. Um, and there are multiple reasons why that's so. But I, I think that one of the things that no one is very comfortable talking about is that there is some kind of, there is some kind of culpability of people who are, you know, of the Jewish community institutions, but alongside culpability of a lot of other organisations and of mainstream media and of the Conservative Party and of the Labour right, but there is some culpability of Jewish communal institutions for doing this. And it's not the first time Jewish communal institutions have done this, have attempted to isolate people who have different views. Um, and we see attacks on um, National Year students at the moment. We've seen attacks on university and college union previously. We've seen attacks on individuals inside the Jewish community and, and outside the Jewish community for these that, that they hold, particularly about Israel-Palestine. And I do think that if you have a situation like you have in this country where 80 to 90% of Jewish people tie their identities to an ethno state, then you are going to be offended by a lot of things that people who are politically engaged in anti-racist struggles say. You're going to be offended by people who stand against apartheid, who stand against ethnic cleansing. And you have no right not to be offended if you are defending an ethno state that oppresses people systemically and has oppressed people systemically since 1948, since its foundation. My, my issue with that is that, that that's undoubtedly true, but that's still a, a minority of people. Uh, the, the, the greater kind of confusion, I think, is um, this discussion about uh, discussing the anti-Semitism narrative and being told that uh, if you're questioning that, you're basically questioning uh, Jewish people who have experienced anti-Semitic racism and you are dismissing them, right? And it's the merging of these two things um, that makes the conversation very difficult or almost impossible. And I but think how that, is how is that merging happening? That merging is happening by an exploitation of identity politics. And that identity politics is identity politics around Jewishness. Definitely, that's an element of it. I, I, I find this really difficult that's to That's true, but that, that's, that's a problem. That's a, I mean, it's, it's partly a problem with uh, identity politics. And, and it's yes. the way that it's used. It's the way that you're using the language of, I mean, the way that Aaron Jones does, of lived experience and yeah. of... Uh, but, but, but my point is that it's, it's not the lived experience of Jewish people that we're talking about. And that, that, I think, uh, how, why is that linked together? It is the lived um, experience of Jewish people we're talking about. That is part of it. The lived experience of Jewish people is that they are upset. A lot of people are upset when Israel's criticised on TV. I used to be upset well, yes, when Israel's criticised on the, TV. That, yeah, but that's not the, the you know, if I, if I start to say, well, um, you know, uh, all of these articles about Jeremy Corbyn and him being attacked about his position on Palestine, that's not me dismissing some Jewish person who's being attacked, you know, but with anti-Semitic remarks. I'm talking about a media narrative against the leader of the Labour Party. It's, it's a completely separate issue. And so it is a completely separate issue, but, but there is an experience. If, if for Jewishness is now constructed very strongly in relation to Israel. It didn't necessarily, hasn't necessarily always been constructed as strongly in relation to a nation state of Israel. It's always been constructed strongly in relation to an idea of Israel as a um, as an origin point and as a kind of aspiration, but not necessarily to a political nation state. But it certainly got tied to that um, in the late, you know, in the late 19th century. And it certainly has increasingly become so that Israel has worked very hard to establish that Jewish identity must be tied to identification with Israel. Um, and, and, and that means that it is a lived experience when you are told that Israel's an apartheid state by someone to feel that that person is, is anti-Jewish. That mm. is a genuine lived experience. Yeah. That needs to be acknowledged as a lived experience and then 
to be rejected as a legitimate basis for any kind of accusation of anti-Semitism. And this might be taken us off course, but it is something that I think is really no, important it's, to it's talk really about. Yeah. And I agree with that. And I think, it, but I think there is, that is definitely a part of what's happening. But I think the reason, you ha- the reason that it's, it went beyond, I mean, it's partly because it's the Labour Party and it's a major political party and people are interested in what's happening in the leadership. Yeah. The reason that it went sort of beyond, it went beyond the Jewish community, right? Um, yeah. And, this, and people who are not interested particularly in Israel, um, they probably take the sort of general, liberal, you know, official British line of, you know, Israel's trying their best in a difficult situation, basically, right? But yeah. they're not that interested. They're certainly not voting on that issue. But it became... The people did worry about Jeremy Corbyn for all sorts of reasons, and this fed into that. But what, what I'm saying is that the when you when you discuss what would happen was that you as a Labour member were kind of already cast as suspicious because of this narrative that Labour was full of anti-Semites and that that, uh, that Labour members were dismissing anti-Semitism within the party. Me, you know, meaning dismissing. Uh, people in meetings being attacked for being Jewish, right? Yeah. And so what that meant was that when you started to discuss the greater narrative and you discussed newspaper articles about Jeremy Corbyn or about the way the membership was being betrayed, you were seen as, oh, well, look, he's dismissing this article. He's dismissing this attack. That's because there a lot of Labour members are dismissing the problem in general. And the, and there's all these, you know, this is, the idea was there's all these, uh, Jewish members out there that you never heard from that were, were being attacked all the time uh, personally for being Jewish within the Labour Party. This was the, the narrative, right? It's a sort of implication of what was happening. Um, there was never any evidence of that. Um, and there certainly wasn't a uh, uh, vast amount of evidence and people being interviewed all the time about their problems in the party. That was just kind of the implication. So that when you discussed it, all of that came to people's minds and they viewed you with suspicion for... Uh, for having an opinion that wasn't, um, yeah, I mean, it's very, it's absolutely very... agree with all that. But I, I think also one of the reasons why Owen Jones, and I, I've watched this Owen Jones clip just the once before, before we watched it today, and it's a while ago, and I find it really difficult to watch because I feel like Owen's just in a very difficult situation. He can't, he, he, he almost can't speak. I mean, he speaks a lot. He speaks way more than Lexi Sale is, but he can't speak in another in sense. So I haven't thought about it that much, but watching it today is like really provoking lots of thoughts in me. And one of the thoughts is why does he struggle so much to even engage? Well, it's, it's impossible for him to engage. He just can't, he's just stuck. I think it is because it genuinely does require him to deny the lived experience of a, the majority of Jewish people in the UK to go along with this. Um, now, the vast majority of people in the UK have no experience of the Labour Party. So in the terms you're talking about, that's true. They, they don't have any experiences of anti-Semitism in, in Labour. But they have an experience that if a party is waving Palestinian flags at their conference and year on year voting on motions about Palestine, then they are singling out Jewish, the Jewish state as a representative of, uh, as a stand-in for Jewish people. And that, that is a form of anti-Semitism. That is a very real feeling and belief. And I think it's very difficult for Owen Jones and for other people to deny that. I haven't really thought about it so much before, mm. but I do think that's an element. And I do think that's um, really interesting that we can't ever talk about Jewish culpability because then we are singling out Jewish institutions. But the, the whole thing falls apart because he has his red lines that Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semitic. And if you're going to go down that road of of that uh, being critical of Israel and being pro-Palestine in any way is basically the sort of the seed of the whole of the anti-Semitism problem in Labour, then, then Corbyn is anti-Semitic, right? And, and a lot of the people that are, are very much invested in this narrative, they go straight to Jeremy Corbyn as the reason that there was anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. He fostered it. He, he yeah. sort of made it up. And so... It's this weird thing where he says, where he says that, well, you know, I don't think it was over exaggerated. I think it's really being formed, but, but all I can say is Jeremy Corbyn wasn't. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, right, uh, to to take that position uh, when he, when Jeremy Corbyn is 
has historically been uh, such a big advocate for Palestine, been so heavily involved, you know, who, who possibly could have done, you know, if, if it's about pro-Palestinian uh, politics, then who is Owen Jones, who does Owen Jones think has been anti-Semitic? And, it, and the thing is, he talks about these ideas, it's people talking about the Rothschilds. It's not about people talking about the Rothschilds online, <laughs> right? That's not the anti-Semitic narrative. It's about uh, people going to meetings about Palestine and then people being called anti-Semitic for that. And then mostly it's about people saying, I don't think that person's anti-Semitic, as we talk about Chris Williamson. It's about saying, I think it's been exaggerated. And if you say it's been exaggerated, you are anti-Semitic. That's what it's about. Right. Yeah. So Owen Jones is sort of talking about a fantasy problem, right? That, um, that's not just so, Owen, is it? The first, the first no. video, big. So the first main political education video was on anti-Semitism that Momentum made. I think they had one beforehand, but it wasn't focused on actually what anti-Semitism is in such a strong way. Was with, um, it was a crossover with Navarro Media with Michael Walker, and it was all about Rothschild's conspiracy theories. Absolutely, this is a problem. It's saying it's it's saying that this is this is what the issue is. I mean, I don't think anyone's heard Rothschild conspiracy theories in Lake Pride. I've never heard them. I don't know anyone. No, and, 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 and Jeremy Corbyn didn't bring, you know, he didn't run on a platform of Rothschild to the problem, right? And didn't get thousands of members to join, right? And there was no discussion. Yeah. And this is the this is the thing. And this is what people think was happening in the Labour Party. They think that there were, and when you said that I that it's exaggerated you were denying that this Rothschild conspiracy theory was happening, but it wasn't happening. And so by denying it, you were quite right. To, so why uh, did Momentum make a big video about it? This is the question. Well, so why wasn't that first Momentum video saying, fucking hell, we're being attacked. We're being attacked in the name of anti-Semitism, but we know this. We've seen this in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. We've seen this happen in other cases. We can use the case study of the UCU Union. We can see, tell people what happened. We can give people the playbook and we can enable people to stand against this. Why wasn't that their video? Why has that never been their video? And that this is this is the situation that we're in. Do you think it was weaponized? It is being weaponized to as an attack on on um, on left wing voices as a generalized attack because most most uh, people who are left wing will be pro Palestinian, and therefore, yeah. Look, I, look. I'll be honest. I've, you know, because of my support for Jeremy Corbyn and for the Palestinian struggle for national self determination, of course, I've had that against me. But I think it's interesting that he admits that he has been wrongfully accused of anti-Semitism himself, uh, but he won't actually ever admit that there's been a weaponization of it or exaggeration of it at all. Um, he, he just ignores Alexei Sales' question when he, when he asks that. So, yeah. um, and I think, you know, to, to say that there hasn't been any, and this is my, my sort of thing that I think is interesting is if you flip this, because the idea is you talk about the anti-Semitism narrative and people, well, the words, what you're saying was no anti-Semitism in labor. And of course, I'm not saying that, no one's saying that, but, are you saying that there's been no exaggeration at all of this problem, you know, ever? And with someone like Owen Jones, he 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 just won't say. He won't say that it has been exaggerated a single bit. He won't let that come out of his mouth because he knows that it, it, we are at a point where you have to 100% buy into this narrative. You can't be critical of it in any way. And I think that's uh, it's a really dangerous place to be, right? Where you you can't say uh any sort of uh so what happens is all the power is with with the accuser right if you just say um that uh well i think this guy's been anti-smith um you can't then say well I, I think in this case you're wrong because you are now uh questioning the narrative and you and the narrative cannot be questioned so what you've just done is completely to describe a witch hunt the dynamics of it how it functions and that's what we're facing and it's really important as we've said before, to acknowledge that and to act on the basis of that. And so we hope again that this video will, as, as the last one we did around, around anti-Semitism, um, this is like a sequel, this is anti-Semitism from Labour Party, what the fuck too. Um, so we hope it will start another discussion. We do think this, even though we're joking a little bit, because when you're trapped in a witch hunt, you must see humour in it, otherwise, what do you do? 
we do think this is very serious and we do want um, to hear what people think of this. So thank you for listening up to now. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, please uh, go to Heather's channel, link in the description and watch her videos as well. Uh, and subscribe, comment, like the video. Watch, watch Daniel's other videos and follow oh, us yeah. on Twitter. And obviously <laughs> all this. And, and Daniel has a Patreon, like, which means that you can give uh, a little bit of money. That. Yeah. yeah, he always forgets about his Patreon. I'm going to have to like take over his promotional uh, yeah, work. Um, it, it means that, you know, obviously it does take time and it does cost money to, you know, Daniel has like editing programs, which like, we need to do yeah, this kind it, of stuff. It takes a bit of time. Um, obviously, I, I really enjoy doing it, but it, it really helps just to have a little bit of money um, for, for putting in all this time to make these videos. And it just encourages both of us, I think, to continue yeah. doing it. So if you if you sign up for like a few quid a month, then you know, you buy us a coffee for when we meet up and talk about the next video, which will be super nice. Yeah. Um, all right, thank you very much. Uh, Heather, again, for yeah, my co-host now, and uh, I'll see you soon. Yeah.